The Konami Code. Certainly one of the most well-known cheat codes in gaming history, it's cited most frequently for its inclusion in the 1987 NES classic, Contra, but in reality, it's actually present in nearly 100 other Konami titles, as well as countless references by other companies, and even sites like Google and Facebook. But did you ever think to yourself, where have all the cheat codes gone in recent years? Maybe you have a pretty good idea. You could easily argue that the decline of codes is due to cultural or developmental shifts in gaming, or that codes no longer fit the artistic vision or the natural evolution of the industry. So let's explore several factors that I believe to be largely influential in relegating the once ubiquitous cheat code to little more than self-referential humor. We'll consider what the function of a cheat code really is, both today and in the past when they were much more common. Lastly, we'll consider what the death of cheat codes says not only about the progression of the gaming industry, but also us as consumers dictating trends over time. In years past, codes were everywhere. Hundreds of games in countless game libraries employed them, and there was a large variety among the methods through which these codes were activated. So before we even begin to talk about the why, let's run down some of the common methods for activating a code. The first and most common method is the button sequence. Of course, the Konami code itself is a series of button inputs, and for years, the button sequence was far and away the most widely implemented. We can even see some interesting variety within this method alone, such as mashing a single button over and over, or maybe something a little more complex like the debug menu in Star Wars Shadows of the Empire for the Nintendo 64. It's been over 20 years since Shadows of the Empire debuted in 1996, and I've yet to find a more complex code before or after this game's release. Uh, Alright, let's call this file, we'll call it Wampa Stampa. So let's see, we have to hold all of these at once. C up, C right, C down, C left, L, R, Z, and left on the D-pad. Okay, let's gently move the control stick left uh, about halfway until we hear a tone. And then we're going to do the same thing, but just move the analog stick to the right, then the left, then the right, then the left, and voila, even a baby could do it. Sadistic button combinations aside, it's interesting to see that Shadows of the Empire employs not only the button sequence, but also file name specificity in enabling codes. You might remember that the original Legend of Zelda for the NES let you name your character Zelda, and if you did this, you could remix the game's main dungeons. Here's another method, option toggling. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is probably my go-to example for option toggling. By playing four specific sounds in the options menu in a specific sequence, you can access the level select menu. This one was pretty clearly done for the ease of development, but for whatever reason, it remains in the game for gamers to discover and use. This is not necessarily a bad thing, and in fact, I squeezed a lot of hours out of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, probably aided by the fact that I could use this code to go to later zones. So we've got button sequences, file name specificity, and option toggling. So with our examples out of the way, let's try to think about a reason for codes to even exist in the first place. When I was younger, I played a whole lot of Diddy Kong Racing for the Nintendo 64, and I loved it. That game had a ridiculous amount of codes, one of which actually unlocked a two-player adventure mode. This always seemed a little bit strange to me, because two-player adventure mode is the kind of thing that you might want to advertise on the back of the box. I mean, it opens up an entirely new component of the game, so why not just include it on the main menu? But no, you have to know the correct code. If this content was available in the game, but blocked behind a certain controller input, wouldn't it benefit everybody more, the consumers and the developers, to let this content be accessed by everyone? The other codes in this game ostensibly don't really have any purpose. You can change the sound your car's horn makes, or you can make all the characters giant or tiny. Still, other codes remove weapons or zippers from the tracks, which I could see being pretty useful for testing and debugging on final or nearly final retail releases. So we have a mishmash of utility, easter egg, and in the case of the two-player adventure mode, some unusual codes all at once. But is there one unifying theme here? I'm not really sure that there is. Let's dig back even farther in time and look at the gaming hardware itself. And by farther in time, I mean the current day. We intuitively know that the PlayStation 4 is, quote, more powerful than the PlayStation 3, which was more powerful than the PlayStation 2, and so on. You could say the same about the Nintendo Switch versus the Wii U versus the Wii and the GameCube and the N64, the SNES, the NES, okay, okay, okay. Looking back now, we all consider the NES to be relatively low tech, but the industry at that point was well-developed enough to produce some truly amazing games. And even though I personally have a lot of fond memories with the NES, it's kind of amazing just how primitive it actually was. The NES used an 8-bit microprocessor with 2 kilobytes of memory, and most games were anywhere between 8 kilobytes and 1 megabyte. And this is my favorite part. Even though the hardware could only produce three musical tones at any one time, some of the catchiest and most famous game music came from this era. Incidentally, there's a strong argument to be made here about how adversity or limitation directly feeds innovation, but that's something we're going to have to save for another time. We do have another long-form analysis on it if you're interested. So pretend you're a fledgling developer and you want to make a game for the NES. 
Well, developers of the NES weren't supplied with a development kit, like most developers are today. Each developer needed to create their own in-house device capable of testing their game. As a result of the industry being relatively young, dev kits were not really commonplace. As a quick tangent, you might be able to see how this leads to the production of unlicensed cartridges. Any developer could create an in-house dev kit for game testing and through the right channels manufacture cartridges. And even though the NES did have some primitive methods for detecting unlicensed cartridges, So now you've got your own in-house dev kit. And you might say to yourself, well, depending on the game genre, it could be a little difficult to test this game. If a game is structured in such a way that its content is gated from the player over a period of time, it would be hugely wasteful if developers didn't have a quick way to bypass these gates to make sure that later sections of a game were functioning as intended. If you were a developer for Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and you had to test something in Mystic Cave Zone, you probably wouldn't want to play the game up to that point each time. Man, if only there were some way to get there directly to get the job done faster. Well, luckily, a few other programmers implemented a level select menu, and that'll just be our little secret, right? But things have changed dramatically for game developers. Nintendo will now work with you to get a standardized development kit that allows a huge amount of freedom as you're designing a game. Some features for a standard development kit might include extra ports, compilation or game recording software, and various other tools made by Nintendo themselves that essentially guide a player down the path that's most likely to lead to a successful launch. And even though the basic concepts of gaming hardware are pretty much the same today as they were back then, there are a lot more game developers today, probably exponentially more. And I think the dev kit probably has a lot to do with that. Of course, good dev kits reduce the need for having these codes, because we can just use the dev kit itself to test our game. And this is where the first major shift for codes comes. It's really a gradual shift in proportion between games that utilize codes for debugging versus games that utilize codes for easter eggs or bonus content. Like we just said, maybe the dev kit has something to do with it, but what else could have caused this gradual shift? Well, I think the functional shift in game codes is not causal. What I mean is, I think it's actually an effect from some cause that we have yet to identify in this discussion. What other causes could there be? Why don't we look at some of the changes that were taking place in the game industry at that time? If you consider the general tonal shift in games over the last 20 years, you might discover that we used to gate players pretty heavily but we've gone from gating via difficulty, where the replayability in games comes from you dying way too much, to gating via exploration. I would take a guess that standardized dev kits have something to do with this, but both methods achieve the same goal. Player pacing is a pretty important issue, and whether it's by difficulty or exploration, it has to be done somehow. And I think player gating by exploration is probably the better option. Well, for most games anyway. I mean, a general sense of exploration and curiosity is inherent to most of us, right? But that gating must be tailored in such a way that to the player, it feels completely natural. As if the player was actually making all the decisions without some subtle guidance from the developers. Without the Konami code, I never would have gotten past the, I don't know, second or third level in Contra, and I probably wouldn't have enjoyed my time with it as much. But that's just me. Everyone enjoys a certain amount of difficulty, but you don't want it to be too extreme. And when you start a game of Contra and you look up at the life counter, you'll see that you have three lives. In my eyes, this is the developer's way of telling the player that the game has been correctly balanced around this number. It gives you a sort of implicit confidence in that number. So even if, like me, you get your first game over screen 60 seconds after starting, you're pretty likely to try it again, and again, and maybe even for 20 years. Making a game this hard without it being frustrating is a pretty fine line to walk. It needs to be just enough to entice you to keep playing, but not so much that you get so frustrated that you'll never pick up the game again. In other words, if we consider codes in decades past to be the sort of antidote to a game's difficulty, this might be one way to explain why codes don't really exist anymore. Most games today aren't gated by difficulty, they're gated by exploration instead. Our gameplay options are now far more robust, and some games even let us change the difficulty during the course of the game. My favorite example of this is The World Ends With You for the Nintendo DS. It's a great example of an RPG that lets you change the difficulty for any battle, and the game rewards you with better items if you make your battles harder. That also lets the game appeal to a wider audience. I think the Konami code gave a lot of people that feeling when they were playing Contra. The Konami code effectively adjusts the balance of the game to be more in line with whatever the player is expecting. You could argue that the Konami code functions as a failsafe for difficulty. Maybe the developers are so good at Contra that they incorrectly judge the game's balance. But we do have an out here just by putting in this code. Let's fast forward to a game like Morrowind or Skyrim. A player could technically finish the game by beelining through plot-relevant quests, and you could reach the credits in just a couple of hours. And yet many players have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on these games. How is that possible? 
Well, as you might have guessed, games like Skyrim are gated by exploration, where the side quests are the main content. Okay, back to Contra one more time. Let's take a look at the level flow here. The game follows a linear path from beginning to end. As long as you can survive, you'll make it to the final boss. Note the lack of any side areas, secrets, or bonus content. The game simply doesn't need these things to entice the player to continue playing, because the completion of the game itself is its own reward. And sure, if technology had been a little more developed in 1987, we might have some of those features, but the fact that a game can still be considered a classic, even without all the bells and whistles, says a lot about a game's internal construction. There were hardly any cutscenes to speak of in these early years, and most games didn't feature any extra content that the player wasn't guaranteed to experience. If a developer has trouble reliably completing the game because of its difficulty, it would be pretty useful to have a workaround. Here we come to the infamous Konami code. Actually, the code was first implemented in the game Gradius, by a developer who was porting it to the NES. The story goes that in 1986, a developer named Kazuhisa Hashimoto had trouble finishing the game. He then added the Konami code for his own benefit, but forgot to remove it before the game shipped. In a 2003 interview, he's quoted as saying, The arcade version of Gradius is really difficult, right? I never played it that much, and there was no way I could finish the game, so I inserted this so-called Konami code. Variations on game codes have made their way into the consoles of more recent hardware too, and they actually have a lot of useful functions. For example, you can put your PS3 into safe mode using only the power button in a specific series of inputs. This is useful for both programmers and consumers, and it doesn't really affect anything negatively if consumers discover it. Other times, they don't serve a specific purpose, but are still fun to discover. If you hold certain buttons on the GameCube controller as the system boots, you'll get an easter egg in the form of different splash screen audio. <laughs> So we've established that cheat codes were originally implemented to give developers easier access to their own games for testing, debug, or whatever. When we consider the N64 PlayStation era and the one immediately following, we start to see a real shift in the way that codes are handled in games. By this point, games are fairly mainstream, the technology available to all parties has improved significantly, and the games themselves are much more complex. Giving 30 lives in a game like Final Fantasy VII doesn't really do you a whole lot of good, because obviously there's no life counter. And every year, fewer and fewer games adopt such outdated mechanics like lives and score count. What kind of cheat code could you actually put in a modern RPG that wouldn't outright destroy the game's integrity? In fact, the abundance of RPGs during this time represents the genre shift that downplayed cheat codes even further. At this point, they are mostly relegated to action or fighting games, usually one-player titles like Grand Theft Auto. The very foundation of codes at this point was severely damaged. Sometimes it was still used for debugging or unrestricted access to a game's content, but more and more we started to see easter eggs for the player to discover, but of course they serve no real purpose. Here's an example that, while cliché, is still one of my favorites. Consider the secrets in Banjo-Kazooie for the Nintendo 64. In the game's second level, you can spell out words using a series of tiles. It took years before anyone discovered that you could spell out entire phrases and unlock certain areas of the game that teased the player with their contents, but provided no actual route to access them. When these codes are entered, not in the form of button presses, but in the form of complex controller commands using Banjo, the player will see a few extra cutscenes that, again, don't really affect the game at all. Here's a weird example from Hudson Soft's 1997 title, Bomberman 64. You can unlock extra battle stages in multiplayer mode, but to do this, you have to mash start on the title screen as fast as you can. You'll hear a sound when you've done it correctly. The logic here kind of boggles me. Clearly, the developer doesn't intend for these levels to be easily accessed by the average player. At the same time, the only barrier is a code that consists of one button pressed repeatedly. We've come a long way since the Konami code was meant to be removed but forgotten, so leaving this code in was likely a conscious choice by the developers. I mean, it makes sense that this code exists since these levels are only attainable after collecting 120 gold cards scattered throughout the game. Gating this content is also fine, especially if the player knows what they're working towards. Giving the player an alternative that is not only easy but requires almost no effort, like just mashing the start button, might detract from what would otherwise be a satisfying reward. If the barrier to play these extra stages is nearly non-existent, it just creates a tedious step for the player. I think the better solution here would have been to just unlock these stages from the get-go. In 2001, the PlayStation 2 ushered in a new generation of gaming, and even though we've seen easter eggs before, this is really the first time chronologically that we begin to see non-utilitarian cheats in abundance. Grand Theft Auto titles for the PlayStation 2 contained lots of cheat codes you could use to give yourself access to weapons and vehicles. It's pretty likely that this wasn't needed much for developer testing, but was instead intentionally added to the game as a treat for the consumer. 
Since the GTA series thrives on its variety of gameplay elements, in particular simply running around its world and interacting with everything to see what happens, it does make a lot of sense to give the player an option to acquire items without going through all the rigorous slog of manually finding them all. At the same time, we started to see the rise of online multiplayer titles like Halo or World of Warcraft, which meant that there was really no place for cheat codes in the average blockbuster. Instead, it was the vastness of these game worlds that allowed for a player to discover similar rewards as might have once been given by codes. Here is where exploration really flourished as the power of consoles grew, and we began to see game worlds that were much larger than we had ever experienced previously. This meant a lot more time exploring, which meant more secrets to uncover for gamers. In a way, the fact that technological improvements in each console generation allowed for bigger and more detailed worlds was a strong catalyst for the death of cheat codes. We now have extremely complex worlds to explore, whether we're doing it on our own or with a group. Sometimes we're trying to kill the other team, and sometimes working together. But by and large, the convergence of mainstream online and massive jumps in developer tools greatly accelerated the death of traditional codes. There's a well-known incident involving a hidden room in Batman Arkham Asylum, a relatively recent title with an easter egg that went unfound for months after the game's release. In a way, this hidden room represents the cheat codes of older generations, in that it provides the consumer with additional secret content, but just as with our Banjo-Kazooie example, this content is found by manipulating the game's mechanics themselves, rather than by a long series of button inputs. So to sum up, we've seen that developer tools, online play, and tonal shifts have had a lot to do with the loss of cheat codes, but the online component does go a little deeper. This online component of gaming does bring a lot of cultural baggage to the table. This is most easily seen in today's achievements or trophy systems. Since such rewards are typically broadcast or available for others to see, it doesn't make sense to dish these out inconsistently. I mean, nobody wants to see that the guy at the top of the leaderboard got there just by cheating. Some games have found a workaround to this problem by disabling score uploading or achievements as long as cheats are active. Ever since these game mechanics really picked up steam in the industry, what few cheat codes there actually were in gaming pretty much dwindled to nearly zero. And although microtransactions are almost universally reviled, they too play a part. Developers are disincentivized to provide cheat mechanics. They might want to later add DLC with a function similar to cheat codes farther down the line, or they might want to keep the game's mechanics as open and fair as possible, so that the addition of any DLC doesn't skew the game balance. For example, you might be debating whether to add a powerful weapon to your game. You don't want just any old gamer to have it, so you choose to gate that content until players have completed the game. You can then spew some cryptic clues around your game world until a clever player is able to solve the mystery, and input the correct series of button presses to unlock it. But on the other hand, this seems like a lot of inefficient work. You may decide to simply scrap the idea entirely unless the game sells fairly well. If it does, and you have willing and able developers, you can actually add that content later on as DLC. This is a slippery slope, of course, but it's really up to the developer's discretion, and I can only really speculate about the inner workings of DLC development. The benefit to this DLC is that, instead of spending an extra week adding this powerful weapon to your game, you can now ship the game out one week earlier, which should save a little bit on development costs. I can't even imagine how much it costs per week to develop a title like Grand Theft Auto or Super Smash Bros. And since the secret content is optional anyway, it's not detracting from the game's intended experience, and you can still add it later, as well as some alternate costumes or NPCs, all for just a low payment of $5.99. That being said, development times have probably gotten a lot longer these days, and budgets have certainly gotten larger. Cheat codes don't really make sense in this context, because spending a few months coding Pac-Man for the Atari 2600 was way less expensive than the work needed to put out a game like Skyrim. With development costs rising, a focus on exploration and longevity, and the obligatory achievement system, it seems like there's just no place at all in today's industry for cheat codes. Because of gaming's modern focus on exploration, it simply doesn't reward anybody for allowing such free access to what a game has to offer, and both developers and consumers could suffer as a result. It's this last point that conveys the overall message regarding cheat codes in games. If nothing else, they've been a useful tool for the industry to eventually stand up on its own two legs and become an independent, fast-growing sector of art and entertainment. They first allowed developers to efficiently playtest their games, and once there were good games on the market, consumers responded by demanding more. It's clear that today's games, being much more sophisticated, have largely negated the need for debug menus that are accessible to just anyone. Furthermore, when a secret like that of Batman Arkham Asylum is revealed, it comes as a big shock to us in the age of data mining. This has been just a brief summary of the evolution of cheat codes, first as a method for developer testing, then intentionally added as easter eggs for consumers, and finally, we've witnessed the gradual reduction of cheat codes within the industry as it shifted towards a more interwoven, frequently online style of game. It's interesting to think that trends like this one come and go, especially when they've persisted for decades. And no matter where we go from here, a small part of me will always be sad about the death of cheat codes.
Hey, it's me again. We couldn't have done this without the very generous support from all of our patrons. So, Alchemic, Parker Myers, Sam Myers, HJ, Delicious IB, Austin Yarger, Sea Bomber, David Lopez, Moogle Girl, Cat Prague, Arno Benefice, Brian Hinson, Lauren Helgeson, Atlas Jackson, and Brian Feralpony Feeney. Thank you all for supporting us. The retrospective for this analysis is now live on the Patreon. Even if you're not a patron with us yet, you can still get channel updates and news on the Patreon page. Apologies for the voice. I recently caught a cold. Again. Ugh. God. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.